and Dick Boyd, 37 years with the club. Congratulations. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our program. So our district governor, Kevin Howell, is, or excuse me, Ken Howell. I'm looking at Kevin. Ken is a fourth generation Idahoan, raised on a family farm. Ken attended the College of Idaho and the University of Idaho College of Law, earning his law degree in 1984. Ken has served on boards of Idaho Public Television, the Downtown Boise Association, and as a trustee at the College of Idaho. During his tenure of service on each of these boards, Ken served as president or chairman. He joined the Rotary Club of Boise, the downtown club, in 2002. He served as president of his club in 2008, and in, in 2012, he was honored with the club's Rotarian of the Year Award. From 2011 to 2014, he served as chair of the annual program fund committee for the district. It's my pleasure to welcome our district governor, Ken Howell. I'll get rid of the box. I think you can see me. Uh, President Michelle and my fellow Rotarians, it's a privilege to be here in the Rotary Club of Twin Falls and address you today. Um, and it's great to see such a great turnout here. Uh, I met with your board last night and we had a great board meeting and we covered a lot of the metrics of your club, a lot of the detail and information about your membership and your foundation giving. and. The good news for you is I'm not going to cover any of that today. That's uh, up to your board to address that with you at a club assembly at another time. Uh, and then after the board meeting, I went back and uh, checked into the motel to stay here overnight for today's board meeting. And uh, I was a little worried about what actually might uh, happen here today. As I was checking in, the clerk asked, well, what brings you to town? And I said, well, I'm, I'm here to attend the uh, Twin Falls Rotary Club meeting. And she said, are you crazy? Don't you know the district governor speaking tomorrow? <laughs> it's the only Rotary joke I know. So. The Rotary Club of Twin Falls has a very long and storied history in our district. And I hope you all know that uh, you were only the second Rotary Club chartered uh, in our district uh, and in Idaho. And so your charter date uh, was uh, February of 1918. So you folks have been around a long time in this area, and you've done a lot of good. Back in 1965... Quick question for the Centennial Committee. Is Idaho Falls in front of us or Pocatello? Neither. Who is it? Boise. Okay. <laughs> you, so you've got a very, very long history. Uh, in 1965, back when uh, our district was part of what was then numbered District 540, um, a gentleman by the name of T. Earl Pardo put together a history book of all the clubs then existing in the district. And so he wrote around to all the Rotary Clubs and he asked them to send in a little bit of history about the Rotary Club. Uh, and he compiled a book which a number of years ago I picked up uh, as a great bargain on eBay. Um, and it's a lot of fun because this is a snapshot of your club in 1965. Uh, and the one thing that I'm really sorry about is even though Ed is Ed Koster is now in your club and has been in your club for a long time, uh, what this history book reveals to me is that Ed actually was a member of the Gooding Rotary Club in 1965, and his name is listed in the roster of members there. He's not listed in the roster of members in your club. But what I want to do is uh, just take a couple of minutes and read for you what your club said about itself in 1965. Uh, but first, the officers in 1965, when this history was written, uh, President Richard Cook, and Richard assures me that it's a different Richard Cook, uh, <laughs> Hugh Call, Jim Kinney, Olene Siemens, uh, Robert Warburg, and directors were Bill Langley, uh, Dan Obenshear, William Powell, and Ted Smith. And this is what your club had to say about itself. In January of 1918, a committee of the Salt Lake City, Utah Rotary Club took a trip to southern Idaho to promote Rotary in this part of the country. At that time, the Boise Club was the only Rotary Club in southern Idaho. Twin Falls was among the places visited, and a committee of local businessmen was formed to study the possibility of forming a Rotary Club in Twin Falls. 
Invitations to join the Twin Falls Rotary Club were accepted by 22 businessmen and on February 7, 1918, the commercial club rooms served as the place and the Twin Falls Rotary Club was formed with 20 members present, being the 379th club in Rotary. That's worldwide, by the way. Their charter being earlier than either Pocatello or Idaho Falls clubs, which were formed about the same time by the same committee. The first weekly luncheon of the club was held on Wednesday, February 27, 1918, at the Rogerson Hotel Dining Room with 20 members present. The club belonged to the then 5th District in Rotary International, which comprised the states of Utah, Montana, and Idaho. District Governor at that time was George O. Ralph, manager of the Hotel Utah. One of the th first things discussed by the new club was the condition of the roads in the vicinity. A good roads committee was appointed, and from this discussion, Eventually, the Twin Falls Highway District was formed in August of 1918. In the early days of the club, its members were concerned mainly with programming various community, community betterment projects, among which were getting acreage for the new sugar factory, building the UP Railroad to Wells, Nevada, and starting and sponsoring the Boy Scout program in this area. The club also promoted a crippled children's clinic, to which over 160 children were brought for examination and raised $1,000 to send one crippled child to the Mayo Clinic. The only charter member now living is Stuart Taylor. Cap Krengel, who joined in 1922, and Ralph Pink, who joined in 1923, are also still members of the club. Present membership is over 95 members, and the club for several years has been a 100% Rotary Foundation Fellowship participant. Twin Falls is the medical center for Southern Idaho and Northern Nevada Midway between Boise and Pocatello. Its blue lakes are world famous, being crystal clear and fed by springs. The town has two distinctive organizations, the Golden Age Club for Retired Folk, Newcomers Club for new registrants to bring friendship to the newly arrived. Twin Falls is a growing city and has become an excellent center for Rotary Conventions. So that's what your club said of itself in 1965. And of course, since that date, your history and legacy in Rotary has only grown and you are a very important club in our district and certainly a very important club in this area. So congratulations on your longevity and I hope that I get invited to your 100th anniversary party here in a couple of years. I want to next talk to you a little bit about uh, one of the signature programs of Rotary and our Rotary clubs. It's called Polio Plus. You may have heard of it. Uh, and by way of introduction, I'm going to play a little video So Polio Plus, it's been a great project of Rotarian since 1985. We got started on the elimination of polio and the Polio Plus program based on some experience that our fellow Rotarians of the Philippines had in the late 70s. They had looked at the United States and seen that we had eliminated polio here, and they said, we can do that in our country. And so they raised funds as a rotary project. They purchased the inoculation drops, and in a few short years they managed to eliminate polio in the Philippines. And Rotary International leadership looked at that and said, what a great project. This is something we can do worldwide. And so they set about to organize the Polio Plus program launched in 1985 with the express goal of elimination of polio in the world. And in a few short years, we did have some great successes. We eliminated polio in Central America and South America across the countries in Europe where it remained endemic and then we started having some slowdowns. Africa was difficult. The Middle East and East India was difficult. But we kept at it. And we've kept at it for a long time. It's been over 30 years now. And in fact this spring Bernadine and I went up to the Butte Montana Rotary Club for their hundredth anniversary and at that uh, anniversary party, Ron Burton, past president of Rotary International, was speaking to them. And among other things, he talked about polio, and he said something that just about made me fall out of my chair. He said, you know what? I am sick of talking about polio plus. And we kind of all looked at each other and said, wow, that's a pretty bold statement for something that's our signature program. But he went on to explain, no one in Rotary thought when we got started on this project that 30 years later we would still be talking about polio being endemic in this world and yet we are but the news is very very good I'm sure you've seen the news that earlier this year 
the country of Nigeria was declared polio free. In fact, there's not been a case of polio caused by the wild virus in the entire continent of Africa in over 13 months. This was a country that if you would have asked our partners at the World Health Organization which were the last countries in the world that would have polio eliminated, they would have told you India and Nigeria. India because it's the most populated country on earth with not very good sanitation conditions and Nigeria a country with almost no infrastructure whatsoever. And yet we have done it in Nigeria. Polio has been eliminated in two more years if there are no cases in that country it will be certified by the World Health Organization as polio free. There are only two countries left in the world where polio is endemic in Pakistan and Afghanistan and even then only in the tribal regions of those countries and yet the news even there is very good. So far this year in Pakistan there have been 31 cases of polio. At this time last year they had over 300. So far this year in Pakistan there have been nine cases of polio. At this time last year there were over 30. That's it. So far this year in the entire world there have been 41 cases of polio caused by the wild virus. And the news is even better than that. Just a couple of weeks ago it was announced that the wild polio virus 2, and if you may know there's three different types of wild polio virus uh, identified by the imaginative names wild polio viruses number 1, 2, and 3, but the wild polio virus number 2 was declared eradicated from the world, has not been seen since 1999. Wild polio virus number 3, the last case was that case in Nigeria over 13 months ago. There's one wild polio strain present left on earth in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And we as Rotarians are committed to the ultimate elimination of that disease. And with your help, and I can tell you that the Twin Falls of Rotary Club has been incredibly supportive of the Polio Plus program. With your help, we will eliminate polio in the world and we will do it in pretty short order. I was in Denver earlier this year at a conference and our partners that talk, that work in the elimination of polio say now that we are talking about the possible elimination of polio in months, not in years. When we say we are this close, we really aren't kidding. And with your help, we'll get there. And I applaud you for the work you've done in Polio Plus in the past, and I ask you to continue it for the next few years while we fully and finally eradicate this disease. A number of years ago I was uh, uh, asked to consider leadership in our district and I was asked to, to think about uh, serving as district governor in the district. And I'll tell you when I was first asked that, um, I kind of laughed it off. Uh, I said, eh, there's no way. You know, I'm, I'm still fully employed. I'm a lawyer. Uh, the lawyers in the room, of course, know that uh, we sell our time by the hour. It's our stock and trade. I said, I don't see any way how you could be district governor and still be employed. Uh, you had to be retired to spend all the time you needed to travel around to our 43 clubs and do all of the other things that you do as district governor. And so really I, I kind of laughed it off. But it did cause me to start thinking and thinking about a few questions and I'd, I'd like to ask some of those questions of you and share with you some of those observations. And the first question that it really caused me to ask was a question I ask myself and I ask of you. Why why are you a Rotarian? Why Rotary? What is it about this organization opposed to all of the other possible service organizations is it that draws us to it and causes us to remain in Rotary? There are a lot of other service organizations. If we all think for half a minute we can name a bunch of them. There's Lions, there's Kiwanis, and they all do good work. And I thought for a while, well, maybe it was because of our international service, Rotary International. We're known for doing international projects like Polio Plus. And yet other organizations such as Kiwanis, Kiwanis International is their name after all, do good things internationally. Lions do good things internationally with their vision and sight program and eyeglasses program. 
So I knew that really wasn't the mark of distinction for Rotary, and I, I thought more about it. Uh, what, what was it about Rotary that, that draw, drew me in, and what is it that draws you in? And as I was thinking about that, I thought about some people that I knew, and I want to talk to you about them a little bit. The first was this man, and I hope you all knew him. This is Dick Fields. Dick passed away a couple of years ago. Dick uh, was former uh, district governor in our district and a founding partner in the Boise uh, law firm of Moffat Thomas. Uh, Dick was a fine lawyer, and I'd known Dick ever since I first started practicing law, and we represented uh, co-defendants in a lot of medical malpractice cases. Um, and I knew Dick's fine, fine reputation as a lawyer and his great skill. But I didn't know anything about him as a Rotarian until many years later when I joined the Downtown Rotary Club, and Dick was a member of that club, and I got to know him as a Rotarian and all the great work he did. Dick and I served on a couple of dis different district committees, and we didn't live too far apart in Boise, so we uh, often carpool to these district meetings. Uh, we'd drive down here to Twin Falls or on down to Pocatello. I spent a lot of time in a car with Dick. And one day it occurred to me to ask him, Dick, how in the world did you manage to serve as district governor when you're still a practicing lawyer? How do you make that work? And Dick told me a story that I, I didn't really know. Dick and his wife Shirley had a great personal tragedy in their lives. One of their daughters was murdered. The murderer of their daughter was their son-in-law. And the son-in-law was tried for that crime and found not guilty by reason of insanity. And you can imagine what a terrible, horrible time that was in Dick and Shirley's life. And what Dick said was being district governor saved his life. It was an opportunity for him as he traveled around to the clubs in our district to see the good that Rotarians do in our state and in our district and internationally and to be uplifted by the work that Rotarians do and counterbalance some of the terrible things that were going on in their lives. And actually that really struck me because up until that point I was kind of viewing the job as all a one-way street, right? You give and you give. And yet we all know as Rotarians that in service we give and we receive. We don't do service just because we like to give. We get something back from it, even if it's just a feeling of knowing we've done good in our community or in our world. And I can tell you personally that one of the great joys of this job has been traveling to all of our clubs visiting parts of our state that often I've just driven past on the freeway, visiting people like you, and getting a better understanding of what our Rotary Clubs are doing in their communities. It's an incredible, incredible opportunity, and I'm very grateful that I agreed to do it. Dick gave me that insight into this position. And I want to talk to you about a couple of other people that were instrumental in my thinking. The first is uh, Ken Cochran, a young Marine from Parma, Idaho, uh, and his fellow Marine, John Luke Bateman, from Pahrumpf, Nevada. Uh, I want to talk to you first about Ken. Ken, as I said, is from Parma, graduated from Parma High School, came from a good military family. His uh, mother was in the Army, his father a former Marine, had a sister who was in the Army medics, always wanted to be a Marine. And so right after high school, he signed up to join the Marines, uh, and after training in the United States and in Japan was deployed to a forward operating base in Pakistan uh, near the Afghanistan, or excuse me, in a Afghanistan near the Pakistan border uh, where he met his fellow Marine, John Luke Bateman. Now, Ken uh, is an engineer in the uh, Marine Corps and these forward operating bases you may know are really not so small cities that are established in the middle of nowhere and they have nothing when they first set up. They bring everything with them, uh, entire infrastructure, including sewer, water, and electricity. And Ken's job was to take care of the sewer systems in that camp. And I guess because it involved liquids, he was also responsible for fueling of the generators. And these generators are huge railroad car size affairs, and they have banks of them that supply electricity to this small city called a forward operating base. And in fact, they have enough electricity that they run some lines to some of the local communities to act as sort of a goodwill gesture to provide them a steady source of electricity that they don't otherwise have. And one morning, Ken was walking to refuel these generators, and as he 
uh, was walking to the generators, he came in contact with one of those electrical lines, and he was electrocuted. And John Luke Bateman saw him and came to his aid and also contacted that line and was electrocuted. Now, I thought about these guys because Ken was my nephew. And I don't tell you that because I want you to feel sorry for me or anything. I've, I've come to peace with Ken's uh, service as a Marine and his decision. He died doing what he loved. He, he loved being a Marine. And yet what really struck me about this as I thought about these guys was I was being offered a position of authority and respect in the district and I was hesitating because I thought it might cost me some income. That contrast really struck me. And you'd think that that would be enough. But I can tell you that really wasn't what caused me to agree to serve as your district governor. I was at a meeting of our club, much like a meeting of your club here, and I saw something on one of the flyers on the table that I had seen a thousand times, and I had said a thousand times, and I know that you as Rotarians have seen this and said it a thousand times on your own, and it was this, service above self. That's what we do as Rotarians, and I submit to you that this is really the distinguishing characteristic that differs Rotarians from all of the other service organizations. I know of no other service organization that says of itself, we serve above ourselves. We serve when it is not convenient to us. We take our time and our money when we would rather spend that time on ourselves or our families and our money on ourselves and our families. And we serve despite that loss and despite giving that away. This is something really that distinguishes Rotarians and I know from the projects that you do in your club and in your community you adopt this motto as well. This January Bernadine and I were in San Diego where we attended uh, what's called uh, the uh, International Assembly. International Assembly is the final training for district governors all 535 district governors from around the world are brought together. Uh, and at this training, uh, the opening night dinner is really something that's looked forward to. And that dinner is where the incoming president, Ravi, this year, Ravi Ravindran, announces his theme for the year. And you've all seen it. It's Be a Gift to the World. And he has a talk about this theme that I hope you look up. It's on the Rotary website, or if you Google 2015 Rotary theme address, you'll find uh, it takes about 25 minutes or so, and it's fascinating. He talks about how when he was a young man off to boarding school, his mother contracted polio, and how the Rotarians in his community came together and shipped in ventilation equipment that allowed her to live, and later shipped in rehabilitation equipment that allowed her to live a productive life for very many years. But in summary of this theme, what President Ravi says is we all receive so many gifts in our lives. We've received the gift of life itself, of nurture, of education. As Rotarians, we have the gift of employment or a profession. We have so much, and he asks that we give some of what we are to make the world a better place. But I think his message is a lot more subtle than that. President Ravi doesn't ask that we write a check to the world. He doesn't ask that we have a death by chocolate fundraiser for the world. And yet we do those things as Rotarians because they're important to us and our communities. But what President Ravi asks is that we as Rotarians take everything we are, everything in our education and our profession, everything in our four-way test, and that we apply ourselves and that we be the gift to the world. We as Rotarians are the gift to the world and we're only gifts to the world when we apply ourselves to do the things in our club and in our community that Rotarians are known for. Before I go today I want to leave you with just a little challenge. You may know we have an issue with membership in the United States. Our membership as Rotarians is down 10% over the last five years. 
And our district certainly reflects that trend, and your club reflects that trend. Without Rotarians, we don't do the good works that we want to be known for. We don't raise funds for our foundation that we want to raise. And so membership's an issue for us. And so I want to leave you with a little challenge. And the challenge is this. Every week for the rest of this Rotary year, I'd like each of you to mention one thing about Rotary to someone during the week. That's it. I'm not asking you to go stand out on the street corner with a cardboard sign and say Rotary needs members or be the person in a room or a party that's so obnoxious that they can't talk about anything else but that one thing. But just once a week, mention something to someone about Rotary. It can be as simple as, do you know, that's great news about the elimination of polio in the world. We're, we're working as Rotarians to do that. What about our projects in our club that we're doing? They're great projects in our community, and we're doing good things. It could be to the person that you're standing next to in line in the grocery store at the gas station or a coworker. Just one thing, once a week. If we all in our district, all 1,815 of our Rotarians, do this, we will elevate the profile of Rotary in our district. We'll create such a buzz in our district about everybody hearing something about Rotary all the time people are going to start asking questions. What's all this good stuff I hear about Rotary? Maybe I ought to check it out. Maybe I ought to be part of it. Maybe I ought to help. I hope you accept that challenge. I know that the Twin Falls Rotary Club is one of our very bright stars in our district. You've done very good work for nearly a hundred years now. And I know that you will continue to prosper in this community. You will continue to serve above yourselves. And I know that as you go forward today, you will continue to be a gift to the world. Thank you.